My name is Zach Moss. I'm your host, and I study the psychology of extremism and security policy, which I'm working on my PhD to get. I came across a statistic by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and the statistic was that 70% of suicides are by white males in the U.S., And I feel like I need to talk about this because not only does it lead to extremism, but this isn't discussed enough. We know that people commit suicide, but we we don't always know why. What is the psychology behind this and how do we prevent it if you were one of the people considering suicide? Well, I do have an answer for you today. However, first, I want to get a comparative perspective on what we're dealing with. Right now, there are 12 million Americans a year that contemplate suicide and approximately 1.4 million who attempt suicide. And so when we think about how exactly does this situation occur, we need to understand as well, where does it occur? And we know that it occurs mostly in the Midwest and the northwest of the U.S. and all of the statistics on suicide, whether it be from the CDC or whether it be from nonprofit organizations, they're all from 2019. And what we can project is that it has gotten worse in 2020 and 2021. However, back to the situation, why does this happen? Well, there's multiple reasons, one of which is rather simple, unfortunately. Because it's a hard truth that we can all understand. It's not some abstract concept. And the idea is that this demographic is lacking purpose. As a matter of fact, there's two psychologists named Erickson and Marcia. And what they had found was that youth who had found nothing to dedicate themselves to while growing up, it became increasingly difficult for them to acquire motivating self-belief systems later in life. I guess what we could say is that they had gone adrift. And this happens especially with the younger audiences, whether it be 18 to 23 or four years old around there while they're still trying to establish themselves and they can't, they don't know what to do with themselves, with their life that is worth a struggle. There's another person that is very interesting to listen to in this field, and his name is Viktor Frankl. He was a professor in neurology and psychiatry, and he had written the book, Man's Search for Meaning. He's a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz. And what he had found in his struggles was that you have to have a sense of meaning behind the suffering that you encounter, and that in these types of hardship areas where they're dealing with a sense of hopelessness and despair and torture and suffering and sadness on a mass systematic scale, there were generally two types of people, those that lost a sense of purpose and belief system and had faded away into death. The other type of person had found meaning in, in living, a sense of purpose. And these people were able to collect themselves and encounter suffering and deal with it and move forward. And what we had found also throughout academics is that when males specifically start to feel this sense of suicidal dread, oftentimes they have a a sense or an idea of who is somebody that is worth looking up to, what attributes they might represent, and how the people who are depressed don't represent those attributes. Their jobs aren't something that they identify with, and therefore they feel as though they are suffering, but it's not going to anything uniquely productive. So they're suffering for the sake of suffering for no specific reason. And so what we find is that it is important for people to be able to develop a philosophical aspect of life, being able to understand specific attributes that they look up to, develop a sense of what life is worth living for, and then build your life around that specific sense. And that is how you stop becoming as suicidal and you find a reason to keep going. But without that sense of purpose, you feel as though that you're drowning in a quiet 
sense of desperation. I actually have personal experience with this myself. When I graduated from the University of Oregon, I was 22 years old. In this period of time, I didn't have a sense of direction and I was completely career motivated. I didn't find happiness in any other aspects of life. I found family time and friend time and these other things as kind of fluff pieces in between the specific aspects of life that needed to be addressed and needed to be done. There's hard things in life that needed to be solved, hard puzzles, mass suffering, and I needed to figure out a way to conduct myself in life that would help alleviate that type of pain, and that's why I enjoyed career so much. And throughout my time at the University of Oregon, I had a sense of purpose, and the purpose was to get good grades, but it wasn't just getting grades for the sake of getting good grades. My dad was dying. He had cancer, and he was worried about what would happen to me in the future when he would no longer be around. And so I wanted to get good grades for him to prove to him that I'm going to be successful and he wouldn't have to worry about me anymore, and so he could die at peace. In that period of time, I didn't think of any other type of goal to be as worthy, and so I focused on encountering as much pain and suffering as I could to get every internship, every job opportunity, and every good grade that I possibly could to the point where if I got a relatively good grade, a B, I would contemplate suicide because I was that serious on trying to get good grades to prove to my father that he wouldn't have to worry about me and he could relax for the rest of his days. My coping mechanism at this time was to work out, but I destroyed the tendons, ligaments, joints, and nerves in my foot, and I was misdiagnosed. So the issue kept getting worse to where when I graduated and my father died, I lost the ability to walk. Well, around this period of time, I also studied abroad in the Middle East, had my fair experience with uh, incoming rockets and the like during something called the Third Intifada in Israel. And so I had time to reflect and feel all of the pain and suffering mentally, physically, and emotionally after graduation, supplemented with a frustration because I had tallied off every job I had applied to, and I applied for 88 jobs in counting, and I could not land a single job. And so I had mounting anxiety and depression and physical pain and everything, and I couldn't find a reason to justify any of this anymore, so much to where I went from 175 pounds lean to 145 pounds in the span of a year. And I went and visited one of my friends in Germany at that time with money I didn't have. And I went to the tallest bridge and I considered jumping off. Though the bridge wasn't tall enough and there was water underneath and I concluded that more than likely I would probably break my foot and not die, which would be the worst case scenario. And so I was having a mental breakdown and crying and all of the like in the middle of Germany while I was unable to walk. And in this walk, when I was alone, I tried to figure out what is even worth living. And in this particular moment, I had a woman from Bulgaria She was in tattered clothes. She had children around her. She ran up to me with a crumpled up piece of paper. It looked like she might have found it in the garbage or found it in her bags or something. She gave it to me, and it says, I'm so-and-so. I'm from Bulgaria. Do you have a pen and a piece of paper? Which is an odd thing to ask a stranger. Not money, but a pen and a piece of paper. And so... I told her, no, I'm sorry, I don't, but I have money, which in most cases, that's what they would want, which would be money. She said, no, 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 thank you. And she went to the next person who had a backpack like myself, and they did have a pen and paper. And it took me about four years to figure out why exactly would she ask me for a pen and paper and not money. And I even told her to go buy the pen and paper herself. And what I concluded was that she was trying to establish her life for her kids on her own terms, by her own hand, on her own accord, by herself, independently, 
and she just wanted a way to move forward. And I think what she was doing was she was trying to write her qualifications for a job. It's the only thing I could think about was that she was trying to get a job. And the reason is because she didn't want money, but she was trying to figure out a way to write with her limited English. And what was interesting about the situation that I'd thought about in that trip was that I was much more depressed than she was, but yet I had more resources than she did. And the di- differentiating factor between the two of us was that she had a purpose and I did not. And so when I got back home, I found a job eventually. I moved cities. I did what you're not supposed to do. And I isolated myself for six months and I concluded that the next time people hear from me, I will either have everything together and I will have a sense of purpose or I will be dead. It is one or it is the other. There's no in between because I concluded that I don't think anybody's going to be able to help me at that point. I went and tried at all. I don't recommend this path, but what I can tell you is that I found a sense of purpose again, and that is helping people. And if it's by helping people through using a voice that I might have, then so be it. And to be honest, defining purpose has it made me happy. No. But is it enough to keep me alive and to keep moving forward? Yeah, it is. And so I think that the psychologists are correct. And I think that other people should find purpose in their own life as well. Because it'll it'll change their life. And I think everybody would appreciate it if there were a lot more people who decided to find purpose and live a little bit longer as well.